everybody, it's Steve Helke Napier. Welcome to the Oracle of the Self. This is coaching session number 33. Um, and today I'd like to kind of uh, first ask you about your homework. I'm curious to know if anyone did notice how they immediately respond to situations that they encounter. So over the past week, did anyone kind of have something happen where you went like, oh my gosh, I know what's happening with my tension. <laughs> so absolutely yes got one to share go ahead feel free brian Anja. Brian, you well, go. Said, yeah i i've been keeping a a, a journal because i say you know i uh, like to create these micro experiments in terms of how what's going on in, in the environment and so what i noted was even with all my routines you know, this idea of transitioning from one activity to the to the next matters just as much as your engagement in the activity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what I noted was when I'm triggered and I might just blurt out exactly what's on my mind, which has never been an issue for me, but it might not <laughs> be the most appropriate time to say yeah. things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did not transition fully to the next activity. So it was just kind of like stack and piled one thing onto mm -hmm. another. So I started experimenting. Okay, let me do some quick PowerPoints, whether it's breathing or whether it's just, you know, scheduling things. I can take a moment to just get recentered in my yes. own way before the call, before the meeting. And I found that instead of me saying, you know, that's like hopefully short-sighted or something that might offend someone, I say, tell me a little bit more about why you feel that way. Right. Right, 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 right. And that's been happening quite regularly. So it's easy to note, notice it. And mm -hmm. then when I journal, you know, how I feel uh, afterward, it feels good. As opposed to coming back and like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Or, you know, maybe I should apologize to this person because I offended them. That doesn't feel as good. And so, all right, so you would do your PowerPoint maneuvers and then you're re-examining the situation. How could we help you to get to the center first? Like at the earliest warning sign of you being triggered, how do you really go like, mm -mm, I know this feeling, I know this thought, I know where it's going to end up. So let me just get to the middle now. Right, so it serves as like a, uh, you know, the best way to not, a, 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 to, mitigate these things is to help prevent them from happening to start with, right? So that means you have to be concerned with before uh, activities. So that's what I've been kind of experimenting with because, you know, in the busyness of the day, we have lots of competing priorities that can be missed often. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so this idea of like giving myself, whether it's five minutes or, you know, so between activities and recentering, this is what's called ultradian rhythm. See, a lot of people understand circadian rhythm, which is a 24-hour yep. cycle, but not many people work with ultradian rhythms, which are waking hours. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so these are 12-hour cycles. And so some people just try to power through the day full on, full yeah. breaks. Yeah, yeah. And that's, yeah. Not, that's not good. It's not regenerative. And so no. what I started to do is how do I break that up? And what the research shows, and everyone's different, and everyone has different thresholds, but what the research shows is typically like an hour and a half, two hours, and then you should power down and give your body time to reset your body and mind. Yeah. And then you go back up and then go back down, up, down, up. So that's mm -hmm. what I'm trying to do, like simulate that. Right. And, and I find better experiences when I Yeah, you can certainly do that by spacing your meals, by um, having a little bit of physical activity once in a while. I know that there's a feature on the iWatch that drove me so crazy. I gave Linda the watch. <laughs> so <laughs> it basically says, you need to stand up. You need to move. <laughs> no, oh, no, thank you. No, thank I'd be you. Yeah. expecting it. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's like, oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, but I understand the point you're trying to say, like, no, if I want to really maintain my energy over a 12 hour period, a 16 hour period, whatever it is, I'm going to have to recognize that I can't go at full throttle for that entire time frame. Right. I have to be able to back you know, off. I used to. Yeah, go ahead, Anja. Even though I used to. Well, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, right. right. That's the that's the part that hurts your feelings. <laughs> you're like, you I said you could, right? You could go for the marathon. You could do it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. right. Like every every couple of months, you'd have to take a break. You know, just yep. a yep. long yep. overnight rest or something. Yep. But, Plus, too, for me, is is connected to a bigger uh, purpose and vision, right? So, you know, mm-hmm. when I'm trying to influence um, these ideas about, especially with clinicians, you know, they're, I, I call them highly leveraged people who are trained to get caught up in their credentials. But mm-hmm. when I'm trying to train them to think about patient first, like how do you help? Patients take greater control over their own health care since that's 80% of what we call health. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to get my ideas across if people feel offended. So right. I have to be able to work with them in a way that, number one, they feel like, uh, you know, they're being heard so that they can hear me. Yeah. And so that causes a shift in how I approach things, but I haven't always been there. In that That's way. really interesting. What what's the biggest hurdle? Just that they want to do what they've always done, or right because it's conditioning. So the conditioning starts even you know far upstream in terms of like you know white coat ceremony, short coat versus a long white coat when you're training the hierarchy and this kind of elitism, and then you earn these credentials. And so although you want to do what you want to do. The, the industry doesn't necessarily allow you to do that. And so you feel trapped because you've paid all this money for school and all these other kinds of things, and you don't want to lose your job. But mm-hmm. so it's this uh, conditioning on top of conditioning and letting go of this idea, but they want to help. Do you think that there is, and I'm just asking, <laughs> do you think that there is a mindset among those people that you're trying to reach that says the great unwashed can't take care of themselves the 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 ants that i Mm -hmm. yeah they have right and there is that that part of it too again that's also on conditioning because we're trained in medical school that the body can heal itself without any prodding or without medication if you position it to do so And see, that's pathogenesis or, or exactly. salutogenesis, right? So pathogenesis is disease orientation. Salutogenesis is creation of health. But is that is that sort of uh, anathema to the medical industry where they want to be caring for you, medicating you, writing prescriptions? Exactly. You want to be God. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. That's what so I would think. Yeah. So it's an interesting dynamic, though. You are of, swimming upstream, my friend. Yeah, I'm oh. trying. <laughs> and so, yeah. so, Brian, let's take a look at what you've just said from a tension management perspective. Basically, you know, we're, I'm, I'm going to say you're operating your day. You're inside of your green circle. Everything's going all nice, nice, nice. And something happens that triggers you. Even that word trigger tells me that you're being moved in one, maybe two possible directions. So is the, what direction is the triggering moving you? Typically up uh, a lot of times out because I have a bias for action to do something. Mm-hmm. Yep, but, yep, yep, yep. No, but I have to be considerate of how I'm doing it because I don't want to burn bridges. And that's what sure. I've been trying to experiment with. Yeah, and so let's take a look at that's what happens if we look at what's going on with attention here. Inside of the green circle, um, you still have all of your emotions are going on. I want to make sure everyone understands that the center of the change grid is not a place that is absent of emotion. It's just that the emotions are all in a rather resting sort of state. None of the emotions are being called upon to put you into motion uh, in any way. And so there you are. They're all going on, but they're more in that that waiting uh, kind of mode, if you will. And as a result, you're able to approach things far more logically, et cetera, and figure out, you know, A, B, C, X, Y, Z. So that's what's really going on there. As something moves you off of that center spot and towards the edge of the green circle and even out between the green and the red, really what's coming into play here is more of a a stronger emotional um, um, display or is coming on, it's being, well, triggered a little bit more. And so what happens is that logic and emotion 
can't really occupy the same space at the same time. So what happens out here? What happens up here to Brian's ability to um, see the situation from that detached, objective, logical kind of mode? Um, if he's, you know, if he's being moved up grid or even out grid, what do you guys think is happening? Frustration. The frustration could be coming in. Now, frustration is a very large dose of emotion coming in on some part of logic that isn't being allowed, it isn't being heard, isn't being allowed to uh, rule the day, you know, because why am I frustrated? I'm frustrated because I see the right way to do something, or at least I think it's the right way to do something, and people yeah. are not on board. Mm -hmm. and so that's what I'm frustrated about. In fact, frustration in its worst form lives way out here on the change grid. It lives at coordinates 12 and 6. This is also where resentment lives. So think about you're in a situation when your ability is extremely high. The challenge is moderate at best in that general range. And people who are plotting out here often feel frustration and resentment, the feeling that they're being held back by people, by situations, by whatever. And so if everyone would just listen to your wisdom and do what you're telling them to do, all good things would happen, right, Brian? Yes. And, yeah. you know, for, for me, it's the idea of because I never get into conversations about people like good or bad, per se, as it is what I am questioning. Is there something that, you know, medicine is quite keen right. on using this right. term evidence based? Sure. I'm like, OK, the evidence is proving that what, what we're doing isn't working. Like how much evidence, more evidence do we need? You know, right. But I'm going to say, if you got triggered, that logic got set aside for a second. All that wonderful case building got set aside and you felt something. And that feeling either moved you up grid, out grid, maybe down and out, uh, whatever. It, it moved you and now the emotion is coming into play. Right. T, right. Yes, go ahead. You so, know, what I heard Brian say, though, was that at a certain point, he was able to mm -hmm. go. I'm, I'm, I don't know what to, how to say this. Step back. Yep. Sort of like catch himself. Back. Yep. Get himself back inside of that green circle, back inside, you know, towards that that power point in the middle. And so that's why, but you know, I guess my little question here, or lesson hidden in the question, is how far away do we have to be moved off center? before we realize we've been moved off center and we need to do something to get back in. You know, if we're going to be triggered, do we dwell now in that state, in that place that, you know, the trigger ultimately caused? Or do we go like, mm -mm, I heard a trigger go off. I'm moving right back in. Yeah, so, that's a state. good question. You know, something that I wrote in my journal was, this idea of taking a allostatic approach as opposed to homeostasis approach. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, homeostasis we hear about all the time. And it's, you know, this this premise of going from order to disorder to order. Mm -hmm. Because homeo literally means same and stasis means standing. But allostatic literally, literally is about going from order to disorder to reorder. Mm-hmm. Exactly right. And, and so to me, that's different. Uh, well, I think it's absolutely right. So let's kind of uh, give everyone an example of this whole set of words um, in a context that I think uh, listeners can connect with. You know, if you go out there and you really start looking at doctors, the different kinds of doctors, you're going to find that they all have the word um, path at the end of it. And mm -hmm. You hear about osteopaths all the time. Osteopaths believe that you approach all medical issues with this idea about, is everything right with the bones? Is there a structural problem? So that whole osteo part are the bones. And if we can't get everything in alignment and all that, then there's going to be problems. And so osteopaths do tend to take a a, a viewpoint that it's going to have something to do with alignment, posture, structure, all those good sorts of things. Well, not until the early 1900s or up until the early 1900s, that was what medicine was. And then uh, schools like the University of Michigan, uh, oh no, then they decided to become, um, just one second, 
homeopathic. Uh-huh. Homeopaths believed that there was something that balance had been had been um, had been knocked off, and we needed to restore balance. And they came up with countless remedies, homeopathic remedies, these little microscopic doses of very odd things that they really believed would bring you back into this homeostasis, back into what is really normal, balanced, et cetera. And so that was really a very popular form of medicine up until the early 1900s, where schools started teaching medicine and more formally, it became more of a thing. And that's when they introduced allopathy. So when you see someone who is an MD, an MD is an allopath. So they believe that disease, illness, whatever, can arise from any number of different um, situations and angles. So they had to kind of toss aside the structures that osteopathy and ho- and homeopathy had always um, uh, managed and just said, nah, let's let's break that down let's reassemble let's look at this through different eyes and so those tend to be there and now of course we have naturopaths um we have um you know if you really go hunting you're going to find all kinds of paths out there brian anything you want to add to that what does the yeah, think, path mean uh, uh the path is the, the where something starts from so a pathology of something is explained the way. How, way, how something came to be. So, so osteopaths are the way of the bones and homeopaths okay. are the way of balance and, and that. Brian, is that how you learned it as well? Absolutely. And you know, what's interesting though is even with the allopathic, you know, as you explained, it means variable or different, mm-hmm. yep. but you use the same one size fit all for everything, right? And well, they so do. You, you they built do. these systems that support that. And so- now you're going against the very nature of what you're actually taught. That creates yeah. problems. Yeah. And so this idea of expansion and uh, understanding these kinds of things, that's what I was uh, looking at. Okay, like why am I so easily triggered here, but not in this situation? What yeah. was I doing here and not in this? And mm-hmm. all of that gave this greater purview of what the possibilities are instead of just limiting myself based on oh, well, I have routine for this, and now it's the one-size-fits-all thing. That becomes limiting. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me give you guys an example from my own kind of practice of trying to become, trying to walk the talk at that. Um, I know that before I find myself being triggered upgrid or outgrid, maybe even downgrid, although honestly, it's still up or out here, I take a, a deep sigh. And I've come to learn over time that the moment I sigh, it is time for me to uh, get back to center. I don't need to let whatever would follow that sigh uh, do that. But do you guys ever recognize that in yourself? You kind of reach where you just go, oh. you know? well, that's the only clue you need to know because your body has no other reason to do that. <laughs> So that's obviously it's going to be different for different people, but I I think it's important to understand that um, something is moving us off center and what moves us off center and ultimately holds us off center is when the emotions get to take a stronger role than the logic uh, does. And so we, we got to get back there. Got to get back. Do you notice a trigger in your, in your, 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 physiology itself when you get triggered because i do yeah well i can definitely tell that uh, my my breathing moves more to my upper chest uh that i become a little bit more rigid in my overall uh, muscle tone um so all those things that would either come with being upgrade because again this is a defense th- there's a call up here to to uh to flee, you know, get ready to flee, get ready to run. So all those things physiologically would be happening. There were out grid. This is where you're preparing to fight. And so to me, a lot of those things posturally and breathing wise are probably uh, somewhat similar. Exactly. That's what I feel a lot. Especially when someone says something I feel in my, my, my heart of hearts is just so dumb. I'm just (laughs) like, dude, you're you're talking about a patient's life and that's what you really think. I can feel like this rush 
Mm-hmm. And that's the sign. To, and you do have a somatic nervous system that for every thought we have, something happens physically to the body. Yep. But again, yep. if we're not paying attention to it, then it every, can't. Every emotion, every thought is changing the recipe of the bowl of neurochemical soup that you're eating out of all day long. Absolutely. I feel that exactly, Brian. Exactly. And here's the funny thing. I've been using this since we started and it's I've stopped myself by saying, well, isn't that interesting? And yep. well, there was another one you gave us, T. There were two of them, and I've used them both. And and I, I've been able to, to quell that feeling. But I'll tell you, I used it in one instance so strongly. And it's it goes back to what you're saying about do you go back to that purple. I went so hard back to that purple that the girl called me the next day and said, did I offend you? Oh, <laughs> stop! And I said, and I didn't even, I didn't. It took me days to even remember what happened because I put myself so, and that never would have happened to me before. I would have been, I would have been able to grab that feeling and that and that anger right, right away. It took me. It was like a, I, I want to say it was like a week before I just relaxed. I was sweeping out the the patio, just thinking about something else, and all of a sudden it dawned on me what it was that triggered me, and I just pulled so, I just pulled back from it completely and absolutely. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. oh, that's what she meant. Right. And she, that, that's a very powerful skill to have, Anja, for you to kind of just it's go. Good, though. It's yeah. very good. It's very, very good. Because, you know, again, we have to keep referring to this. This is a practice. We constantly mm-hmm. have to be learning about ourselves. And because the situations we're exposed to are, you know, can be variable from one moment to the next, we have to be responsive. We have to be resilient. We, uh, you know, I'm using words that are occurring in different places around here, but we have to be resilient. We have to be courageous. We have to be thoughtful. We have to do all these things. And that's what ultimately helps us have a more rich and reliable inside the green circle sort of world for ourselves. But it it does take time because if you think about it, if you really practice this and you really get proficient at the practice, it's amazing how you start to observe the degree to which emotion is ruling everybody around you. And you just go, wow, you know, people, there is an easier way because emotions take a toll. So, and I don't care what the emotion is. I promise you, it's going to take a toll sooner or later. So um, even if it's one of the more positive ones that can still be exhausting, like, like Anja talking about being able to really play beat the clock at a certain time in life. I just thought thought of it. See, I wonder if that's what kept me going. So I, I was in that state. You definitely were. So we know that when people are uh, in certain areas of the change grid, uh, they can be they can become lost in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And that can be a very positive thing when it comes to getting whatever they were doing done. But if that becomes such a pattern that sooner or later, I'll give you an example of this. We talk about downgrade engagement. And one of the best examples we give of downgrade engagement is a scientist sitting at a microscope. Now, they're not moving very much and they're not doing very much, but there they are. And um, um, they are as engrossed as they're going to get. They're, they're lost in the work. Time is flying by and they don't even notice what's going on with the passage of time. Well, they were really able to get lost in that work. But can you imagine if that becomes part and parcel to how they operate all day, every day? Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. it's going to take a toll is the whole point. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, so we need to be able to call upon these uh, these states when they serve us well. Uh, right. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. So, T, do you mm-hmm. find that is uh, easier or, or becomes easier or for you as you get older? This used to come to me like quite easy when I was yeah. younger. You know, and I'm sure 54 tomorrow to be in that practice, like, because, you know, I've been doing it for so long, but the older people get the more rigid they become. It seems like it. I thought that as you get older, it gets more easier, but I always feel like, Mm -hmm. and I don't know if this is just in playing out to my own mind, but I always feel like there's a sense of urgency. So I take what I do quite serious and I don't do so, you know, uh, apologetically. Uh, or, uh, you know, um, I just think life is serious. You only have one. 
And so I, I play that card, but again, if I'm not doing it right, then it becomes offensive to yep. people. And now you got to clean up, you got to clean up whatever that, that mess was. Right. I think right. to your point, everyone else can chime in on this. I think that there's two things happening at the same time. Um, and that is that people do become more rigid, but they also become more, some become more focused than ever on finding this peace, harmony, balance for a whole lot of different reasons, whether it's just about their mental health or they realize that their mental state has a dramatic impact on their physical state. So, but this takes great practice. And so I would say to you that when I was in my earlier years, I love this whole idea about practice because I was practicing too many things and oh. so I never really got particularly good at any one of them. Where as time went on, I said, you know what? I tried the meditation. It's not for me. If I, you know, I tried that not for me. And I ultimately found out that for me, I like yoga. And so when I'm doing my yoga, yeah, there's physical stuff going on. But for me, yoga is far more about mental, emotional sorts of stuff than anything else. And so perhaps it is that as we get older, those of us that are, um, aligned to this way of thinking, um, are able to devote more times to the practice. Um, Can I tell you as an old person something? <laughs> Susan, except for Brian, no offense, everyone else, except for Brian, we're all old. Here. Yeah, <laughs> and except for Anna. Yeah. We all live here. <laughs> Brian couldn't live here. <laughs> well, we only have to be 55 to live here. <laughs> Is young. I don't consider that old, but I think sometimes when you're talking about, I, I don't know, at least I can only speak for myself at this point. And I hate to use this, but well, I'm just going to say it stupid. You know, I don't have a lot of place in my life for stupid people. Yeah. That's a good yeah. word. It's so a if, the, if that's rigid, they, you know, I try and keep nope. the, nope. any you're of my right. circles. Yeah. The, the other thing that then, what frustrating and doesn't it disappoint you over and over? No. No. Oh, I'm so disappointed in people. Go back to there. Yeah. No. Well, I, you know, they still try and say to look at if you can find something good, find something good. But yeah. the other thing I want to tell you is my birthdays never bothered me until I got to seventy. Uh -huh. Never. Uh -huh. And. What happens is you have this, you know, little gauge and, you know, you're going up, up, up like the little, the little choo-choo that could. But when that, when you're young, that little choo-choo, when you go down the hill, that's a good thing. When you get to 78, it's like, uh, it's going in a different direction. All right. Yeah, you don't I, have a lot of time to mess and with that's, stuff. I think that's the part of it. You get be, you become more selective about what you're going to allow to occupy whatever life you have. You know, I think I jumped on that choo choo anymore. like two years ago, Susan. <laughs> I really do. It was like all of a sudden I'm like, why am I beating my head against the wall? Yeah. 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 Well, my and the other problem, well, it's not a problem. My dad lived to be 98. My mother lived to be almost 90. So oh. everybody thinks like, oh, you know, I want to be just like your dad. <laughs> oh, no, you want to be just like my dad at the age you are now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, he had his mind. So I guess when you start thinking that, just let me keep my my brain. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, you're right. You're right. You're right. That's so, so spot on. So spot on. Was he depressed, Susan? And, uh, does it depress me? No, no was no. he depressed? Your your father. Um, I think so because he, um, you know, he he has. When you live in a community like this, your friends either move or they die. Well, it's true. No, it's true. <laughs> you know, so I think that kind of weighed on him. And then my mother died before he did, and I think he was thought he was going to escape that reality. <laughs> My dad, yeah, my dad did the same thing. His mind was sharp as a tack. He lived in 94. Yeah. Yeah. They were the youngest people when they moved in, my folks. You're in Sun City West too, right? Yeah. Yeah, my folks moved here in the 80s, 81. 
And they were the youngest people in the neighborhood, you know, anywhere. And then, people, you know, obviously they outlived everyone and, yeah. and his health suffered and he, he was prone to depression. Yeah. I'm pretty sure he was OCD too. Well, I think that's, you know, one of the motivating factors we had in creating the Oracle of the Self and retiring, but not letting the work retire is I really do think that the over 55 population needs to have this awareness about what's going on with them emotionally, how they're reacting and responding to things and, you know, everything that comes along with what you guys have been going through for 32 plus hours now. So uh, that's what I really wanted to do was focus on that, that population, because it's just tragic, particularly yes. in, an, in a um, community like this, where you really are mere steps away from as much social support, social activities, physical activities, creative pursuits, you're literally steps away from it. And for people to, to be here and be isolated and be um, depressed just seems like a real tragedy. Yeah, I think what Susan said was quite important because this idea of uh, not wasting time and life on the, you know, the things that don't add value mm -hmm. matters. And see, I what 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 gets me about my generation and this generation, I've always been around older people. And so, you know, even my seafood and martial arts had this just wisdom that I was just so allured by. Just like, how are you taking on life this way? My mom was is the same way, you know, my grandfather. And so you look at today's culture and it's all about extremism. No one balances things. I hear young people tell me all the time, if I can just live on an island with all my technology, I'll be just fine. Yeah. But if you look at longevity studies, one of the key things is about relationships. So whatever life you have, can, it, can you live it with such a quality and at your own capacity that you're not burnt out at the stakes, I think has to be mm -hmm. one of the most important mm -hmm. yep. elements. And I see, you know, people like Chip Conley, who helped Airbnb, he coined this term called mentor, like intern and mentor together, because he was a hoteler and the founders of Airbnb were like in their 20s and 30s. He was already in his 50s and they asked him to mentor them to help Airbnb get started. And he said he learned a lot from them. So it's like this symbiotic kind of relationship. And so now what he started is something called the Modern Elder Academy. And he's telling people who are, you know, 55, you know, Susan's age, look, you still have life to live. And there's some things that you can be adding to this world so yeah. that however long you have, live it your best, make it your best. As long as you, as we just discussed, as long as you have a mind. Yep. And I think that's important. Because you know this idea important. of fifty is like, oh yeah, man, you're you're older, you're you're older. Yeah, what? well, That's yeah. Crazy. Now, Brian, Brian, you have to be able to look at what you've just gone through at, from attention management perspective. So, who are these people, or where are these people on the change grid that do continue to live vibrant lives and they do keep themselves stimulated in every way, shape, and form? Where are they on the change grid, or at the very least, where are they absolutely not? On the yeah, change out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're, you know, they're, they're up here where it's they're being a little bit, um, you know, engaged where there are some puzzles to solve. There is a little bit of challenge or or there's some they're really good at and they're trying to really just go out there and really exercise it. So they tend to be out here. People that are this far down grid. These people become hermits. Mm. So they they detach, not in a good way. I mean, they really are just separating themselves. Uh, from but you can see how uh, honestly, I hate to just to, to what Susan said. Yeah. I can completely understand why someone would go down in apathy when they feel surrounded by stupid. Well, no, you're right. You're, they expensive. give up. They give up. Yeah. And the culture does. What Brian said is absolutely right. It works against us. People get stuck in their whatever their arrogant, whatever their comfortable niche is and whatever they work so hard for, they don't want to give up. 
or maybe just what they had to give up that they want to mentally stay there, the average person that you, you get surrounded by stupid, it's disappointing and it's, uh, it's true. Well, you get surrounded by stupid. Let me expand that because there's, <laughs> there are some others that are there. Like for me, my trigger Nuvin is- Nuvin has coined a new phrase. Yeah, surrounded, <laughs> by, stupid. surrounded, That's by, another surrounded phrase. by stupid. Surrounded by stupid. I like it. T-shirts are forthcoming. Um, so for me, I can't handle being around people that are displaying any emotion to a heightened level. I, I find it really, uh, I don't know, it triggers anxiety in me, I like mad. So particularly negativity or when people are worrying about things that are not even happening, um, you know, or imagining things to the point that for them it's become real. And I, don't know, I just, I mm. can't handle that as, as I get older and older. So, um, so uh, I, I would say that in addition to blatant stupidity, negativity is another one that people will finally say, this is drawing a line. I'm not willing to do this anymore. Uh, but I'll give you another example without naming names. Very important that we don't name names here, but very close to our community are a couple of other si similar communities until you really start to get to know the people inside of those communities and you realize that they're very different. And one of the biggest differences I noticed is that there are several communities around us where the people who move into those communities are still trying to prove something to somebody. Yes. You yes. know, and they don't realize that retirement is the great neutralizer. So they're still out there needing to keep up with the Joneses, needing to maintain some yeah. sort of, uh, you know, appearance or whatever. And for me, that is to me all just evidence of insecurity. And I also use insecure people as a place where I draw a line. Uh, so, so you guys are absolutely right. Stupid is probably the most noticeable of them. <laughs> but okay, I, I have something that I want to want to read to you. So it sort of sums up my idea about this. I found these crazy socks at a Hallmark store, but this is what this one says: Everyone has the right to be stupid. You are abusing the privilege. <laughs> 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 Love yeah. it. So that's can, I, can I get them by the gross? There you go. Exactly. Exactly. They should be passed out at a welcome wagon. Can't, can't be <laughs> T, Anja and I noticed, I put this theory together six years ago when we moved here. I expected different mindsets in people than I found here. I realized in that. In retired people? Yeah, in a retirement community. I realized that a lot of the people here they were in high school and they were on the football team, the basketball team, the cheerleaders, cheerleaders. They were popular. They were going to parties and then they went off to college. And 50, 60 years ago, you had to study in college. Yeah, so it wasn't yeah, a party. Yeah. And that was a whirlwind. They left college, got a job. You had to work for a living then. So that was another whirlwind. Then they got married, had kids. That turned it into a tornado. Their yep. kids, they retire. They move here, they stop and they look around, the tornado's gone and they say, now, where was I? Oh yeah, I was a cool guy, halfback in high school. That's and right. immediately that persona comes mean, back. Yeah, mm -hmm. the mean like girl. And now they're trying to reclaim that. And that's, that's really great yeah. because a like, community like this gives people abundant opportunities to go and pursue those things yet again or whatever. But mm -hmm. where the question is always going to be, where are the people um, that are taking advantage of these kinds of things that are using their retirement for personal growth, for expanding their horizons, for, you know, gathering new wonderful experiences, where are they on the change grid? And, they should uh, be in the center. Yeah, they're, they're here, maybe a little bit out grid because they're, you know, they're inside the yeah. green circle for sure. Probably yeah. really try new things like anyone who's going to try pickleball. You're a little bit out grid. Okay? <laughs> you're a little bit out but just because you've taken a pickleball doesn't mean you're better than me. Exactly. Often you exactly. sustain and then turn your back, which has happened to me a dozen times. Exactly, exactly. And then, you know, of course, we have a lot of projections. So uh, one of the things that I wanted to share with you guys uh, is uh, the tension management aspect of Burning Man right now. Oh, 
Burning Man is something that Linda's sister Sally has gone to several times. Oh, and so she was one of the photographers for the event and on and on and on and on and on. And when you talk to, when you look at the news, they're saying like these 70,000 people are trapped and blah, 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 blah. Um, let me tell you what the truth is right now for the people that are at Burning Man. The people who really are of the Burning Man mindset are fully prepared, came fully prepared to take care of themselves through tonight because it doesn't end until tomorrow morning. They weren't even planning on leaving until tomorrow. They have enough food, they have enough water, but more than anything, they brought with them the attitude that they're going to take care of one another and support and encourage one another. And no one you know, needs to be worrying about this, that or the other thing. But all these outsiders are seeing that, yeah, the playa is now, uh, well, I think it's subsiding now, but got to be deep water, deep mud, and all these people, they still went and they had their fun. They still did what they were doing. It's the people who couldn't, who really should never have become burners is what they're called shouldn't have become burners that are the ones that are trying to hike out that are the ones that are trying to drive through mud they're making it all worse for uh, for everybody else it's and like so yeah and so yeah. i would say to you that the world looking at burning man are probably feeling very upgrade or like oh that can't be allowed we need to go in there and intervene and uh, you know make rules and make laws and control 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 but if you're one of the people that are there and you're a genuine burner you're basically kind of going like well this is what this year will be remembered for right. And so it's very interesting to uh, to kind of say, how often is that same dynamic playing itself out inside of an over 55 community or inside of just life in general, where outsiders who aren't there experiencing it, who have never experienced, who know absolutely nothing about it, but what they're getting from um, uh, media that has an intention, that has a, um, you know, a desired outcome in mind, they're sensationalizing it. So again, how often are we finding ourselves being pulled in to some sort of drama that if you just were inside of you kind of go like, what are you talking about? We're, we're, we knew we'd be here until at least Tuesday morning. <laughs> Yeah, it's like the lady who was cooking baking there for everybody this morning. Right, because there's no money allowed on the playa. No one buys anything from anybody. Everything is gifted. And some people come there quite literally with semi-trucks filled with food uh, so that they can throw big parties and say, anyone who stops by our camp, uh, you can, you're, we're going to be serving this and you can all stop by and have whatever you want and whatever. The Burning Man at its core is all about, it's the first one is about self-sufficiency. So you got to look at these rules and now they're going like, you know, there's all this mess. One of their rules is leave no trace. And so, the, you know, the, you have to kind of just go, what is the motivation in them sharing the story about uh, about Burning Man? Well, that's not happening, leaving a trace this time. <laughs> well, they won't leave a trace. I promise you, the people who run Burning Man will, will make sure that not a speck of glitter is left on that playa. Now, What's once playa? people... Can you define playa? The playa is where is the, 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 the table of the... Um, uh, where the uh, in the desert where the whole thing is held, it's a very large flat space. Oh, so, so it's an actual... yeah, because Playa, yeah, Playa, you go to like Playa del Carmen, Playa, whatever. Mm -hmm. I think it's just a flat area. Oh, but they call it the the, the Playa is what they were you have to have, you have, to have a Playa name. You do, you go by a different name when you're a Burning Man. Yeah, uh, the woman this the other woman this morning that I I had a chuckle over is the one who will appreciate her indoor plumbing when she gets home yeah absolutely <laughs> absolutely because there are some things that need to be done differently but i'm just telling you the people that are there who have the genuine heart alignment with what burning man are all about are having a different time that they had anticipated but don't think for one moment that they're having a bad time bad time so yeah okay so anywho. we're getting the same thing and that is nowhere near the scale but i'm experiencing the same thing with people who live outside of the state everybody's calling and saying are you burning to death are you yeah you know, it's, like, deep? it's like well for god's sake you know it's a it's a couple months right it's the hottest, it's the, hottest the weather's ever been and what do you mean by ever 
Yeah, what do you mean by ever? I don't know, somebody else has recorded history. I'm like, well, that's quite different from ever, isn't it? Isn't it though? And you can, you're just gonna know like all of us had moved here knew we were moving to the desert. So why is everyone more concerned about us than we're concerned about us? Uh, I go back to, to Burning Man, the the, uh, the people who run Burning Man are shocked by the attention that this is getting. <laughs> they, they were offered of national guard. They're like, we don't need the National Guard. We're perfectly self-contained. <laughs> well, I think there's a lot of curiosity about it because not that many people are involved in it. So well, it's true. I mean, this year they had 73,000 people show up for and it. And you have to kind of, you know, I mean, it's natural to worry about them if they get torrential rains and well, right, I mean, right, 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 right. Yeah, but you know, again, this goes back to how easy it is for us to be exposed to some story that we only know a tiny bit about, and suddenly we get pulled in uh, there. And, um, you know, suddenly the government wants to send the National Guard. Nobody asked you to send anybody. <laughs> so, God, really? If anything, could just stay off our two lane road so it could dry out. You know? <laughs> Uh, it's hysterical. I didn't realize it was that big of a deal. Right. They they don't. They're going like, oh, this, this is to be expected. These are routine things. When you look at the packing list of what you're supposed to bring with you as a burner, um, it's all spelled out right there. It's all spelled out right there. So anyway, my point is I wanted to show that as an example of how quickly people can get uh, can get derailed. And again, if it's coming from any media source, they're trying to make money and they make money by putting stories that captivate you long enough to see ads and then take action on those ads. Well, in trouble makes news. If things are going right. well, that's not news. Yeah, so, like we said like, last time, the agony of things are going well in Sun City West. That's, yep. that's boring. But yeah, it's very boring. We run know. over and somebody gets knocked off their motorcycle and then run over. Now that's news. That's news. That's that? <laughs> all right. by the same woman. <laughs> yeah, all at once. It's like what? So yeah, he went flying off of his off of his motorcycle by some hundred feet or whatever, and then she ran over him. It's yeah. like what? <laughs> oh anyway, there you go. Um, all right. So um Again, I bring these things up because while the conversation is interesting around them, they're merely examples of how frequently we end up being presented with a message of some sort or a situation of some sort that's going to pull us off center. When it pulls us off center, how quickly can you recognize that the pull is happening so you can intervene on your own behalf? Yeah. That's what we're looking for, the early warning signs, the early warning signs. So that was one of the two things I wanted to cover today. The other one um, will only take a few minutes because it uh, was a rather short question that requires a rather short answer. When we're looking at a change grid, whether we're doing it personally uh, inside of a class like this or professionally when we're doing change works profiles with clients and, and that, we very, very, very frequently see activities that are plotting upgrid outgrid and downgrid. So you guys who've done a lot of change grids, you know this, we see lots of things happening up here, out here, down here. Rarely do we see much being plotted in grid. And so the question came up, why is that? And so I'll first open it up to the floor and just say, can you guys think of any reasons why we might not have uh, 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 very frequently encounter activities that are plotting in grid where you got to say your ability is six or less and the challenge is six or less? Why might that be? There aren't that many amiable people in the world. Well, there might not be all that amiable <laughs> people. That's certainly true. That's certainly true. I'm having trouble of thinking of a scenario. Well, that's what I want to give you guys is some scenarios that, that fit here. So I'll give you some of the reasons why we don't often encounter here. The first one is because um, we're prejudicing people's activity selections when we say things we really want to look at mission critical activities. We really do want to look at the goals that you're working on. We want to look at the problems you're trying to overcome. You know, so in some ways, we're kind of prejudicing the activities that they're going to come up with. So we're more likely to find plottings upgrid and outgrid. Just remember that in the true change grid, in the true change grid does not exist on a screen, in a diagram, uh, you know, or on a piece of paper in front of you. The true change grid is in your head. 
And the one that's in your head doesn't have a half a dozen or a dozen activities sprinkled on it. It has everything that's going on with you, um, um, you know, plotted on it. And that means there's plenty of things that are going to be in grid. But because we pay attention to tension, we know that the things that are further up grid are demanding more of our attention. And because we, we uh, are driven to do certain things, pardon me, we, you know, we do have goals, we do have objectives, assignments, whatever, need to do, we, we do find ourselves being moved out grid. So they, they get recognition. It's not the stuff in grid that does. So let me give you a few examples of the kinds of things that would plot um, in grid. So if I said to you, you guys should come over and uh, let's, uh, we got a new board game. Let's, uh, let's pull it out and play a board game. So I say to you, uh, from a change works perspective, how do you rate your ability to play that game? Well, in all likelihood, you're going to rate it. What do you think? Pretty high or pretty low since it's a game you've never played, let alone even you know, looked at. Pretty low. What's that? Pretty low. Pretty low. And how challenging do you think it's going to be for you to play a game that comes in a box? Um, well, Six. moderately. And Moderate. if there's embarrassment involved as well. <laughs> well, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but going into it and the whole scheme of the range of things and challenge we feel in it, when it comes to playing a board game, we're likely to say something more like, well, how difficult could it be? It's a board game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. right. You know, or it's a new card game. I can't play it. I don't know. I don't know how to do it, but how tough can it possibly be? And so we're put in these situations often that I would say are rather hmm, inconsequential or ways of passing the time, things we're doing while we're bonding, uh, or like, like this, let's say um, you decide you're going to cook something new for dinner and you pull out the recipe book and you're going to make something you've never made before. Well, how do you rate your ability to make something you've never made before? Well, it's probably going to be on the lower end of things and how challenging could it possibly be? It's a recipe. And so these are the kinds of things that we would find plotting more in grid. Now, if you've done a lot of cooking, you could say, well, my ability is going to be really high. Or you're looking at the recipe and go like, well, my ability to produce this is much higher than that. And suddenly, rather than having a pleasant kind of pass the time, enjoy a rainy day uh, sort of thing, uh, now you're, you could be bored by it. And go, well, this isn't challenging. This isn't particularly stimulating, or maybe you're reading the recipe and say, I need an air fryer. I don't have an air fryer. So now what happens? Perceived ability shrinks back a little bit, perceived challenge goes up, and you're no longer in, in uh, this in-grid region anymore. Now you've moved a bit further you know, up or, up or out. Uh, or another example I'll give you is that um, you've been um, asked and agreed to go and put in some time with one of the volunteer organizations, whether it's food kitchen, I don't care what it is, but you're, you've been asked to do this, to just show up. Well, you go there and you show up. How do you rate your ability to be the volunteer they need you to be? Well, initially it's going to be low, uh, but, and how, but at the same time you're kind of going like, well, they know I'm a volunteer, they know I don't know anything at all, so I can't imagine they're going to give me a particularly challenging task. And so there you are doing something to be, and let me show you another layer of the change grid just to put this all together for you. You know where these things come from. That's where the follower and the helper in energy comes into play. And so, yeah, we'll play a game. We'll have a little bit of fun with it. And then you figure someone who's in that, that little uh, group who's playing this board game you've not played before, they're going to become the one who decides to read the instructions to everybody. Well, that's a little bit more of the administrator. <laughs> You know, and someone else is making sure you got a spot, a, pot, a spot to put your beverage or whatever. Maybe that's a little helper, but you get the idea. This is what's happening inside of that. So if um, you go there as the volunteer and you go, well, my ability is a five. The challenge might be a five. Uh, that's at least inside the green circle. That could be something that feels purposeful and uh, useful for other people. That could be a, a nice um, in the green circle kind of a, an experience for you. But if you show up and go like, well, my ability is a three. The challenge is a two. All right. Well, so fine. Here I am. I'm going to do whatever needs to be done because I volunteered to do it. Now, if I come back to volunteer again and again, and they keep giving me the same task over and over, what's going to happen to my perceived level of ability? 
going to go up. It's going to go up. It's going to go uh, up. And sooner or later, I might uh, stop being actively following whatever the directions are, instead thinking about them, getting lost in a daydream, or just not showing up. So hopefully whoever this administrator is, or actually the charity we know is run by a leader, there are going to be influencers and advocators that are going to be involved in it. They have to know that the next time you come to volunteer, maybe I can make you a team leader over that task. And That's right. You better be prepared to do something. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Because they're going to keep raising the challenge as you're learning more and more. And now you're becoming a little bit more valuable uh to where they're where they're called please do go ahead yeah um so when i look at this i think that thinker is a good thing to, a good thing to be because you're you're following and it's easy and yeah. so you start to think about what you're doing and how to improve it but is that wrong no 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 it's absolutely no. right but the question becomes then well what if i keep on doing it and keep on doing it see as long as i view my ability as being an eight um, maybe a nine, uh, maybe even a 10, as long as there's still enough challenge, and that's only like a two or a three or a four, I'll still be doing it and thinking about it. And I, if anything, I might uh, be doing it while I'm thinking about ways to improve upon how it's done. Mm -hmm. you know? okay. But if I end up down here, because I keep doing the same task the same way over and over, I'll go through that thoughtful kind of process, but I'm going to end up in the downgrade danger zone. Or now I am just bored. And by the way, that's going to make me careless. Um, that's going to perhaps make me sloppy, um, you know, because performance is going to suffer when tension is too low. So it sounds like there's two different levels of uh, being detached, because if you're like a super master uh, down grid, you know, where your experience is high, you're, you're going to be disengaged. Uh, you know, because it's just you know, yeah. Well, even just look thing. at a look at our own diagram. This this band right here is engagement. Mm -hmm. So I'm not even in downgrade engagement anymore. I'm maybe down in downgrade awareness, but I could just be in this downgrade hypo awareness uh, kind of place, kind of oblivious, going through the motions, autopilot. Uh, under the radar, all those kinds of things can happen down here. And now I'm bored, ambivalent, depressed. I'm becoming careless, uh, whatever it is. This right, is right. But then in grid, you don't know what you don't know yet. And no, so you're open to helping. That's that help. Right. You know, you're there kind of going, you know, I'm amiable if that's my energy. And by the way, anytime you're doing an activity that falls into this little quadrant, you are amiable about that activity, about that at that particular moment in time. So playing a new game. Yeah, let's have some fun. It's a social kind of a thing. Let me help you at a charity. Yeah, let's do that. Let me cook up a new recipe. Well, why am I cooking a new recipe? Is it for me? Because I'll probably eat the ingredients in their natural state. <laughs> so. <laughs> you don't need to combine them and turn on the oven. Really, I'm I'm very happy with cookie dough. <laughs> so, actually, just give me the bag of chocolate chips. <laughs> I'm good to go. I like where you're going with this. I'm just saying, you know, it's like so. So I just want you to kind of know that this this quadrant isn't vacant because there's nothing there. This quadrant is vacant because the things that are there don't warrant our deeper examination. Where when we fill out a change grid, it's either because we have untapped potential down grid and we're trying to get re-engaged, revitalized, or we're out grid and we're trying to accomplish something and move things forward, or we're upgrade and we've got a big puzzle that needs to be sorted out. Or, you know, here we're, uh, we're actively involved in problem solving. Down here, where all our creative juices are flowing, you know. This is where things are moving forward. If there was an arrow, it's pointing to the right. And so this is why we tend to see these things not because there's nothing in our lives that would plot here right can you guys relate to that yeah, yeah. so we're, we're yeah. not dead <laughs> not, no, we're yet. not dead yet <laughs> no. no and so we do get asked to do these things maybe not as frequently but wouldn't that be nice if we could just find a balance and say you know having a little bit of that social interplay social interaction some of those caring behaviors uh, volunteering for certain things. I mean, volunteerism is a really big deal in in uh, these kinds of communities. Um, even if it's not a formal thing, you're just kind of you know, keeping an eye out for the neighbor's house or yeah. making sure they're like we had to uh, have, I don't know if she's still there or not, but 
there's a house, four houses down from us. And Linda and I were out for a walk one day and we glance over and to say that this door, uh, this little entryway where the door is, had at least 100, 200 packages from Home Shopping Network and Amazon. We've seen Not that. Exaggeration, right? Wow. Yeah, it's happening. What exaggeration. Yeah, no, it happens and you just go like, you know, any porch pirate who's trying to steal somebody's package off of some little porch in some normal neighborhood. <laughs> Good grief. Here's a whole store for you. <laughs> right, because obviously the person who's inside of that house um, is, um, and, and the, the, the pile keeps growing. So we know when that- they went to California. Yeah, right. they're actively buying things. They're mm -hmm. actively buying things, but they don't have enough physical energy, perhaps, mm -hmm. to go out and bring the stuff in and open those boxes. All mm -hmm. the frosting, none of the cake. Yeah, and so when Lynn and I saw this, we thought we might need to call the posse and see if they can do a wellness check. Um, but the, then we saw the neighbor and said, nope, that's just how she is. <laughs> so it's like, okay. Or it's a drop place for stolen goods. Well, you know, <laughs> that's what I thought, but no, no, this, this gal's, um, this is how she basically, yeah. Crazy, crazy, crazy what we saw there. All right, wow. anyway, um, so I just wanted to make sure I put that question to rest for uh, um, the person who asked is going to be listening to the recording. So they, they kind of know. We got plenty of stuff that's here. It just doesn't, how to say, it doesn't make the cut when we're putting together an activity list about things we really do want to um, take a deeper look at. Uh, that's why. All right, questions, comments? Oh, I just have one quick one. I put something in the chat, that little quote that I gave you, the sorry oh. doesn't The sorry doesn't go there. That was because I hit the button and it broke up the sentence. <laughs> I love that everyone has the right to oh. be stupid. You're <laughs> abusing the privilege. Well, I'll share uh, one that's uh, perhaps a bit similar to that one. And this is something that I would bring up in the courses that I would teach for about negativity. And one of the things that I would say is that when it comes to a workplace, family situations, friends getting together, I believe that every human being is entitled to a little bit of baggage. But if that bag won't fit under the seat in front of you or in the compartment overhead, you need to check it at the door. Mm. You with me? So yeah. I get it. You don't need to bring in all of your luggage <laughs> into every conversation that we have. I charge people for that, you know, let them, <laughs> let, let them know that. It's like, no, 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 no. Everybody gets a little bit of baggage, but uh, yeah, a I little a bit of baggage. <laughs> all right. So how many of you can relate to some people bring far bigger, they, they, they bring their, what should be checked. Uh, they bring it into every discussion you have. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, That's I, frustrating. I, it is. Because yeah. like, yeah. uh, for me, I can actually hear myself go, oh, and then I know <laughs> got to get myself back to center. Yeah. Back. Really by the way, that, that breathing pattern could very well be a downgrid maneuver all by itself. Uh -huh. I'd have oh, to know sure. the physiology of a sigh, but yeah. I believe the physiology of a sigh is about bringing, uh, clearing out your the, the bad air in your lungs and bringing in. Uh, more oxygen. I don't know the physiology. Anybody know, <laughs> Tom? Yeah. See, see, it's a people who train or work with or have animals, dogs and cats, but dogs will do this. A non-aggressive dog, if he's faced with the situation, you you just meet him, you stare at him too long, you're constantly looking at him. A non-aggressive dog will take a deep sigh and put his front legs out in front of him and rest them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like a little stretch. Yep. That's their own down grid maneuver. Take a deep sigh. It's their way of going down grid rather than up grid. aggressive. Mm -hmm. Or up grid and growling. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think I shared with you guys that when I was in college, I uh, did a lot of uh, research work and one of the projects involved uh, monkeys. Nothing was happening to the monkeys of any, you know, anything invasive or anything like that. But there was a sign on the cage and the sign said, sign on the door going into the where the, the monkeys were, sign on the monkey's cage that said, whatever you do, do not look these monkeys directly in the eye. And so what do you think everybody did? 
Looked him in the eye. <laughs> exactly. And they freak out. They absolutely freak out. So if you try to maintain that kind of eye contact, they view it in a very threatening sort of way. And then we yes. have to figure out how to calm down. the monkeys down. Hmm. Go ahead. Um, yeah. A cat will just look at you and turn their face and walk away. Right, because we're inconsequential in a cat's life. We, <laughs> we simply represent convenience. <laughs> That's all we are. We represent convenience. Right, Cato? There you go. All right. So thanks, everybody, for joining in. Those of you who <laughs> join us for the Circle of Brilliance, uh, just be aware that we will not be having a call on Thursday. That's mine and Linda's uh, wedding anniversary. And so we haven't decided what we're going to do because, you know, we don't really know of anything we feel like doing. But I imagine we're going to come up with something. <laughs> and Tom, you guys, is, are you the day after us or the day before us? We're the 13th. Oh, you're the week after us. Hey, we're one week I, I think it's, we have someone else among our flock that mm -hmm. their anniversary is the day after ours. It might be Dave Miller, uh, David Joanne Miller. Yeah. Okay, anyway, there you go. All right, thanks everybody. Take care. We'll talk thank you, team. Bye for Thank now. you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.